So uh, thank you very much. It's a honor for me to present today our results um, accomplished within the Nano Explorer project, which is funded by the European Commission Life Instrument. I will speak today about the reference values of biomarkers, mainly biomarkers of oxidative stress that we could assess non-invasively in people. And we will discuss the relevance of these values for understanding and interpreting biomarkers results in epidemiological studies and more generally for clinical applications. The outline of my presentation is as follow. I will shortly remind the definition of biomarkers, how we develop biomarkers before they could be applied in clinics. Then I will provide you some definitions regarding reference values and reference interval. And then we will see the application of these guidelines to define reference interval in the concrete example uh, developed with a nano explorer and an alternative way to deal with reference values of biomarkers. So let's start with the definition of the biomarker. There are very many definitions because the first one dates from 1949. It was for biochemical marker and the biomarker was first mentioned and defined in 1957. But today I will use the definition provided in 2016 by the Biomarker Working Group, which belongs to the Food and Drug Administration and National Institute of Health in the United States. They defined very shortly the biomarker as a defined characteristic that could be measured as an indicator of normal biological process, pathogenic process, or as an indicator of the responses to an exposure or intervention. And if we consider the pathway from the exposure or intervention until the di different uh, steps that could occur in the organism, like early biological changes in response to this exposure or some modifications in the structure or in functioning of our cells or tissues or, or organs before the disease, at every stage, which is specified here, we could define some particular biomarkers, which could inform us either on the absorption of the toxicant in lung or in the uh, digestive tract or through the skin. It could also inform us on the pathway and pharmacokinetics of the pollutant within the body, its distribution, elimination and metabolization. And in this part, we will speak about exposure biomarkers. And when we move to the right part of this graph with early effect, we could consider the parameters which belongs to toxicodynamics uh, with uh, some uh, insight on damage which could occur at cellular or tissular level, their repairing processes or the secondary adaptive responses. So it's a useful uh, and helpful uh, view to consider different steps of biomarkers. And again, on the right part, we would rather have the effect biomarkers. And of course, because of differences in our genomes, we, some people could be more susceptible to react to some pollutant at the stage of the exposure or in expressing the early biological effects, which could be reversible, less reversible, or harmful uh, going until the disease occurrence. I should say that there is many different typologies and ways to consider the biomarkers. And what I presented below is uh, depicted here, and it is represented in the circle of pharmacodynamic or response biomarkers. So this definition is mostly the definition which applies for clinical biomarkers and the disease biomarkers or effect biomarkers, but still we could find all sorts of biomarkers here. And of course, some biomarkers could be useful to predict some disease occurrence or to help to make the diagnosis with a lot of biomarkers already used in the clinical practice, but we could also have biomarkers useful for pharmacological applications in drug development to see some side effects, for example, or some susceptibility risk biomarkers, and for a very well established biomarkers, including biomarkers of exposure, we could have used 
of these biomarkers for monitoring purposes, especially in biomonitoring of people. As I said, the type of biomarkers is defined and depends on the usage we could have, but it could also depend on where we measure these biomarkers. And with this consideration, one might distinguish between central biomarkers, which are measured in vivo directly, for instance, using the radio imagery procedures, or peripheral biomarkers, which could be measured from the biological samples and fluids extracted externally from the human body. And in our work and uh, in our applications with Nano Explorer project, we are mostly interested in biomarkers which are easily uh, accessible in peripheral fluids, like urine, for example, and exhaust breast uh, uh, condensate. So later, I will mostly speak about effect biomarkers, and there is a particular definition to, for these uh, effect biomarkers because uh, they, of course, also respond very well to the general definition of the characteristics that could be measured um, as an indication of the response between the exposure and disease. But here, these effect biomarkers are biomarkers which are associated with an established or a possible health impairment or disease. Why I am more interested in these biomarkers and why they are more uh, useful for uh, projects like Nano Explorer is that usually the effect biomarkers could be measured uh, well before the occurrence of diseases. So they reflect subclinical changes. And when dealing with exposures and uh, hazards uh, or pollutants for which we don't have clear ideas about their toxicity, like engineered nanomaterials, using uh, clinical uh, or effect biomarkers is helpful for anticipating the potential adverse effects of nanomaterials and also to investigate the, those response or those effect relationships statistically between these biomarkers used as health outcomes. There is a very long, usually the journal between discovery and application and validation of a biomarker is very long. And uh, many biomarkers are usually abundant at the analytical validation state. Because for a good bio, to have a good biomarker available for clinical applications, we need to be sure that this biomarker is measured with high reproducibility and present a sizable signal to noise ratio. Of course, for this, we should make a lot of analytical validation studies to identify the limits of detection, limit of quantification, to be sure of the reproducibility, sensitivity, and specificity of the results. And as I said, for many biomarkers, this step is not validated well enough to switch to the clinical validation. But for those biomarkers which could be used in a human, in vivo, in occupational on environmental settings or in hospital settings, the idea is to see what will be the usefulness of biomarker for which application we will develop it. And as we saw the typology, these biomarkers could be investigated with respect to the diagnosis of a disease, to the severity of a disease, or for the prognosis of the disease. And then for some of them, the use could be the biological monitoring and, and the screening in the population. However, for make a large screening in a general population, we need to have biomarkers which are easily accessible for their detection and measurement, and ideally accessible using non-invasive sampling procedures. So we should develop biomarkers that we could measure in urine, in exalt air, in exalt breast condensate, as examples of these non-invasive biological matrices. Another important requirement before switching to the application of these biomarkers, even those which could be used for screening non-invasively, that we need to have reference interval to know how to interpret individual results measured in every population and every individual of this population. So now I will 
um, some minutes to describe what are the reference interval. To measure reference interval and the, to have all this definition, I will use the framework of the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry. So, of course, to measure the reference interval, we have first to establish the reference population where this interval could be measured. And it is a hypothetical entity which consists of all possible reference individuals. Who are the reference individuals? Reference individuals are all those individuals that could be selected ideally using a randomized selection for comparison using different defined criteria. And of course, the most important criteria is to make them representative of the reference populations in terms of gender, age, and some specific life habits. The reference individuals selected in a study where we could measure a biomarker of interest will constitute the reference sample group. And the reference sample group should have an adequate number of reference individuals to provide meaningful calculations and estimates of the reference interval. And the minimal sample size required for establishing a reference interval is 120 participants. So when we have our reference sample with a sufficient number of individuals, we could uh, measure the biomarker and the values or the test results of a biomarker measured in every individual participant will belong to the will constitute a distribution of our reference values, which is called in this case, the reference distribution. So it is just a statistical distribution of the values measured in our reference sample group. And from this distribution, we could establish the reference limits, which are nothing more than the limits of the 95% confidence interval around the mean value measured in the reference distribution. And to transform it in the reference interval, we should just consider all values between these limits, lower and upper limit of our confidence interval, including these two values. So now I will show you how we can apply the guidelines to establish this reference intervals. These guidelines were co-authored by the uh, International Federation for Clinical Chemistry and Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute in 2008. And these guidelines is still operational and, uh, and good to, to follow. This guideline define all steps to establish reference interval and it starts from precising how we have to select the reference individuals and all statistical uh, uh, aspects that should be assessed. And among these uh, aspects, uh, we have to pay a lot of attention on the examine of our reference distribution, especially with respect to the normality of this distribution and the presence of the outliers. What are the outliers? Outliers are measured, are the measured values, which are defined as values more or less 1.5 uh, interquartile range. So here you can see the box, box plot of a distribution. This distribution is perfectly normal. It is a Gaussian distribution where we could define the mean, which is uh, normally equal to the median. And we have these quartiles with the first quartile, uh, so from the lower we start here, the first quartile, a third quartile here and here. And from this distribution, we could define the 95th confidence interval and the values which are uh, uh, lower or, or higher than these values are considered outliers and should be discarded. And according to the type of the distribution, there are different methods to identify these outliers and to discard and treat them. The second important aspect to mention here is the consideration of the variability of the reference value. So we should examine the influence of different characteristics of our reference sample, like age, smoking habits, some particular diet, for example, or other um, aspects like some susceptibility factors to uh, how they influence the values. 
And if there is an influence, we should apply the partitioning of the reference values and provide the intervals per stratum of age or of sex or other characteristics. So we applied these guidelines to a biomarker that we measured uh, and that we developed at Unisante in our laboratory. The main investigator is Guillaume Suarez and uh, the oxidative potential in the exalt uh, air is measured directly. It takes only six minutes in all and it is based on the Fox assay, which is a photometric method which allows to see the oxidation of iron uh, three to iron, uh, iron two to iron three complex, which changes the color of the Fox solution. So to do this measurement, uh, Guillaume Suarez and his team developed a, a device which is called OPIA analyzer. And uh, the exalt press is provided and collected in this one liter Tedler bag, which is then connected to the by the by the connector to the device. There is a step of procedures which is performed, and this uh, color change is measured and registered in the in the text file in the computer. Then this information is uh, uh, translated to calculate the values of the slope in time because this change is uh, measured in, in seconds and uh, the correlation coefficient and using the linear calibration relationship, we could trans transform the slope values into the concentration of the overall oxidative potential. And this even in very extremely diluted samples like exalt air. So what we also do is the standardization of the OPR by the oxidative potential in the ambient air because the air we breathe, we inhale, could reflect also the state of the oxidation of the air which is exhaled. So we do uh, usually the ratio of OPA by oxidative potential in ambient air to standardize for this influence. So as I said, we need the reference sample to measure the reference value and establish the reference interval. And the sample that we used uh, was uh, uh, constructed within the Swiss Health study. And we nested in the study our sub-study called OPR SHIS study. SHIS is the acronym for Swiss Health study. It's a big study coordinated by the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health in collaboration with Unisante. And the aim is to have this uh, reference population for assessing the exposures to environmental substances and the associations that these exposures could have with human health. So the idea is to follow the trends in this exposure response associations and also to follow the prevalence of important diseases in Switzerland. It's a very huge public health uh, project uh, supported by, by our Ministry of, uh, of Health, of course, and for the region of Lausanne, which is situated in the canton of Wood, 500 citizens were randomly selected by the Swiss Federal Office of Statistics to participate, and these were all adults people. So we used the opportunity that this study was launched, that it was uh, coordinated by Unisante as a co-partner, to nest the measurements of OPA in this study sample. And we also provided some questionnaires to have additional data on the characteristics by which OPA should be stratified if necessary. So it was done during the COVID pandemics. And uh, however, we could have quite a good participation with 250 people providing the measurement of OPR, but also spirometry results and questionnaires. We excluded from this sample all those who had self-declared or diagnosed using spirometry acute or chronic diseases, or who had declared that their general health status was not good enough because we need to have healthy individuals in the reference sample. So here you can see the distribution of our participants. We had more female than male. They were almost of the same age and we could assess the characteristics such as diets, 
body mass index and smoking status, which are important to consider when dealing with reference values. Here you can see the first distribution of the OPA, which is standardized by the oxidative potential in ambient air. As you can see, the distribution is skewed on the right, and we have a lot of, well, a lot, some outliers. And when discarding these outliers, we could normalize pretty well the distribution and have a perfectly symmetric box plot. So for this data, we then look how the different uh, population characteristics might influence these values. And you have here two tables. Don't be afraid that they are not easy to read. What I would like you just remark is that one is provided for oxidative potential in exalt air as a rough estimate. And this one is for the estimate corrected for ambient air, but the this, they have the same variables as, uh, as uh, predictor variables. And as you can see, all p-values to see the effect of different variables like sex, age group, diet, body mass index, or smoking status are exactly the same. So it means that we did a good correction and it's perfectly coherent. And as you can see, all these values are greater than, than 0.05, which means that none of these characteristics has influence on, on the value of oxidative potential measured here. And you can see that the values are pretty uniform and even on the ratio OPA, o, OP in ambient air. So we don't need partitioning in this analysis. And it also means that uh, OPI is a very robust biomarkers, which does not differ between sex, between age group and smoking status, which is very good for a biomarker that we could further use in clinics. Now, how to determine the reference interval? There is this algorithm that shows that if we have normal distribution, we could uh, directly estimate the, the confidence interval and the reference values. If it is not normal, we have to transform. And uh, without uh, <laughs> looking at the normality, we can always use bootstrap because it's much powerful statistical technique to establish the confidence interval and the reference interval as well. So you saw that we had a pretty normal distribution after treating the outliers. However, we decided to apply the bootstrap method after 50 times resampling our data set to have smooth and precise limits of our interval. And we also applied the same bootstrap pr procedure to establish the 90% confidence interval for every limit of the reference interval, which is confirmed with the guidelines that I presented before. Here you can see the results of this calculation. We have the mean value for the OPA, the mean value for the ratio, which is standardized by oxidative potential for ambient air. We have lower, lower limit and the upper limit of the reference interval and the 90% confidence interval for every of these limits for two parameters. How can we use this information? We can use it very directly. And I will show you how. Here you can see the results that we obtained in Nano Explorer study. And uh, later on, you, you could hear the, the Professor's Bergamaski presentation regarding <laughs> this study. So we measured oxidative potential in our study participants, and we, we stratified them according to the level of the exposure to engineered nanomaterials. And as you can see here, we could compare our value of the mean, but also the minimum and maximum measured in non-exposed people, which is even lower than the lowest limits of the interval range. But for people with low exposure, you see that the mean value is already beyond of the upper limit. It's higher and it is almost a free folder increase compared to the upper limit of the interval that we observed in this result. So this is how we interpret our values measured in the Nano Explorer. And it is also how these values could be used in other application and in other projects. Now, 
what can we do for other biomarkers? Because our lab is also working with biomarkers uh, of oxidative stress measured in urine or in breast condensate, like uh, or HDG, isoprostane, and malone dehaldehyde. These biomarkers were developed several years ago, and many results have been already reported in the literature. And when we have a lot of results reported in studies, in epidemiological or toxicological or human exposure studies using cross-sectional case control or cohort studies, this provides some estimates. But usually in these studies, there is always a control population. So a control population is either non-exposed compared to exposed subpopulation or people free of diseases compared with those who, are, who have a disease. So we could consider this control population as a reference sample group. And the big advantage of systematic reviews and meta-analysis that they could increase the precision of the overall estimates of the values uh, which could be then extracted from the reference sample group and considered as reference value and summarized with a reference interval. And here you can see this triangle, which actually represents a hierarchy of epidemiological study designs according to the level of proof they provide. And as you can see, systematic reviews and meta-analysis are on the top of this hierarchy because it is a very powerful tool to systematically approach, appraise, and synthesize the combined information. However, it's not a quick way to arrive to a single summary estimate. And there are many, many steps, like in an individual uh, field of observational or other studies. So it starts with a protocol development where we should consider the scope of the literature search, the literature search strategies, the problem with defining the population, the sample, study sample, exposure, and, uh, and health outcomes. Then we should evaluate all individual studies with paying a lot of attention to the potential bias which could be present in every single study. And only then we could integrate all individual study evidence into summary evidence. And sometimes it's possible to do the quantitative synthesis, which is called meta-analysis, but it's not possible every time. And what's important to say that the meta-analysis and systematic reviews is a very multidisciplinary work because we always need an epidemiologist for bias assessment and design issues, a librarian to, to ensure that the literature search is uh, exhaustive and, and exact, a bias statistician if we do meta-analysis, and we need, of course, the the subject matter specialists and coders who extract the data, screen the data, and do this work, which lasts for at least uh, two years in, in average. So when we could do the meta-analysis, the primary goal is to have the summary effect estimates with statistical confidence limits. But this is only possible when studies are homogeneous. So if they are homogeneous, we could combine and apply a model of fixed effect. But if the studies are too different because of different design, different methods used for analyzing a biomarker, uh, some bias issue, some, like, there could be many differences or populations are too different, for example, sometimes it's better to not combine them and stay with a qualitative appraisal and or use the random effect model to combine studies where the heterogeneity is an issue. But it is also important to use this step carefully to investigate the sources of heterogeneity. And when doing it, like in the reference interval estimation, we actually could decide if it is necessary to do the partitioning or the stratification of the values measured in our meta-analysis to provide it according to specific characteristics of a population. So for the biomarkers that we have in the Nano Explore project, the three that I measured in urine or in EBC, we established the standardized protocol, which was registered in the International Prospective Register of Systematic Reviews, PROSPIRO, 
and uh, we defined all processes of this protocol from the literature search, the inclusion criteria for every article, but also the statistics and uh, the data transformations, because as you can imagine, every individual study uses its own unit. Sometimes it is standardized per gram of creatinine, sometimes it's not standardized, sometimes it's 24 hour urine, sometimes it's hot urine, and of course, different. Uh, analytical methods could be used. So we have to deal with it carefully and assess for it in statistical analysis. All this is described in this protocol. And we applied this protocol to free biomarkers in EBC and in urine and provided all the results of the values that we considered as reference value, which we could further discuss. And the results are now available. And I hope they will serve to interpret correctly the results obtained with the Nano Explorer and other similar projects. And we also have the deliverable with a Nano Explorer uh, to provide all these results together in one report. This is what I wanted to share with you and I thank you very much for your attention. So good morning, everybody. Today, we will speak about uh, the need for an integrated and harmonized study protocol to assess exposure and early effects in worker occupational exposed to nanomaterials. Getting inside from uh, the ULIVE project NanoExplore, this is uh, actually a very hot topic in the scientific community. The increased production, handling, and availability on the market of nanomaterials brings innovative applications, but can also lead to personal exposure with the potential for unforeseen adverse health effects. In particular, workers in company manufacturing and handling nanomaterials are supposed at risk, as uh, they are likely to have earlier and higher exposures to both nanomaterials and incidental ultrafine particles than the general population. So far, most of the knowledge we have on potential adverse effects comes from in vitro and in vivo toxicological studies. Such studies are very important for understanding potential toxic effects and mode of action of nanomaterials relative to their specific physical chemical properties. However, the interpretation in terms of human health implication and risk assessment is hampered by the fact that in vitro and uh, to a lesser extent in vivo studies represent simplified biological models. Such uh, insufficiency and ambiguity of the existing toxicological data on nanomaterials has been recognized and that it hampers the risk assessment process required to define scientifically sound regulatory and policy decision-making for human population. Yet overcoming uncertainty due to the high inherent limitation of simplified model is pivotal to ensure the safety of workers and consumers and for the responsible development of uh, long-term sustainability of nanotechnology enabled industry. When uh, dealing with new and emerging technologies, such as nanotechnologies, is uh, reasonably to assume that epidemiological studies will be needed in the future. Therefore, epidemiological studies have been identified as risk prediction tools and a mandatory component of a strategy aimed to anticipate potential adverse health effects related to exposure to nanomaterials in humans, particularly for medium and long terms. Provided that occupational setting deserves attention, it is recognized that launching epidemiological studies among nanotechnology workers with a comprehensive exposure assessment and uh, 
biological, if not medical surveillance program is challenging for several reasons, such as the heterogeneity of particles and their potential effects, factors related to the assessment of exposure, the need to identify a population of workers with long-term exposure to nanomaterials and of appropriate size. Next factors related to the assessment of exposure, the need to identify a population of workers with long-term exposure to nanomaterials and of appropriate size. And last but not least, the propensity of companies to participate in the field studies. A recent systematic review identified 27 studies in humans exposed to nanomaterials published over the past 15 years. 18 of these studies were cross-sectional, including four studies with no control, uh, not exposed group, I mean, and a very small sample size from two to 70 workers, characteristic of a, an exploratory rather than an epidemiological study design. Only four research teams could conduct repeated measurement of exposure and outcomes with variable follow-up duration from six months to 12 months, usually by adopting a panel study design, which is particularly sensitive to detrition because the number of participating participants sorry, remaining at the subsequent follow-up usually drops dramatically. But especially, there is a, these studies that are all cross-sectional have uh, the advantage to show the involvement of uh, four organ systems, namely respiratory and cardiovascular system, especially immune system, and to confirm the oxidative damage to nucleic acid and lipids as the central mechanism of action of nanomaterial. However, such settings preclude the causal inference analysis. Therefore, the evidence of potential health effects of nanomaterial exposure in humans remains limited. The conclusion of this uh, review is there, that there is a need for longitudinal epidemiological investigations with clear exposure characterization for various nanomaterials to discover potential adverse health effects and identify possible indicators of early biological alterations. In this state of uncertainty, only the precautionary principle can be applied. In addition to methodological limitation of existing studies, several scientific issues hamper the realization of court studies of nanotechnology work. To this regard, several years ago, an international panel of experts emphasized that before launching a large scale study on health monitoring, it is paramount to determine feasibility of such a study, as well as to assess the usefulness and reliability of the results. They strongly suggested establishing well-defined frameworks that will help to properly identify study populations and select the study design, characterize exposure and define appropriate outcome measure. The use of biomarkers was encouraged for both assessing and monitoring exposure and early biological health effects of this exposure. Studies of nanomaterials effect on human health are still experiencing many issues, practical, scientific, methodological, and also political and regulatory issues. At present, the last uh, seem to be the most challenging. What is apparent, however, are the achievements in exposure assessment and the increased availability of biomarkers. The biological monitoring is thus becoming a key component of this strategy. It has been used for decades as a fundamental tool in environmental and occupational health risk assessment to identify potential hazards of new and emerging chemicals through the periodic detention of early 
preferably be reversible biological indicators. In order to enable feasible and acceptable routine screening in population at risk, biomarkers should be analyzed in biological matrices collected by non-invasive procedures, as uh, remembered by Irina before. From this perspective, exhaled brief condensate, exhaled air, and urine are the three preferred biological matrices for the non-invasive investigation of biomarkers, as they give insight on local pulmonary and systemic oxidative stress and inflammatory responses. The U Life Project Nano Explorer aims to answer to the following research question. And the Nano Explorer Consortium has been committed to address these research needs and to develop a harmonized protocol to, to set up an international multi center prospective court study with the aim to investigate the potential health effects related to nanomaterial exposure in nanotechnology workers in European Union and Switzerland. NanoExplorer aims at developing the feasibility of a harmonized approach encompassing continuous assessment of external occupational environmental exposure to nanomaterials and incidental ultrafine particles, and biological monitoring of resulting internal exposure and their effect this exposure may have on human health. Implementation of a protocol in occupational setting concerned with nanomaterial exposure should demonstrate the feasibility of such studies in different exposure scenarios, facilitate further epidemiological studies and health surveillance program and inform stakeholders in charge of regulatory aspect targeting occupational exposure to nanomaterials at particles. As a first preparatory steps, we have uh, identifying and defined targets nanomaterials, manufacturing processes, potential exposed workers, biomarkers, and biomonitoring procedures relevant for exposure and health by reviewing the published literature and technical reports. Moreover, especially uh, the study was needed by Unisante, uh, we conducted an online survey of nanotechnology companies to assess the acceptance, the propensity among managers and for the first time among workers of a biological monitoring program, as well as the practical aspect affecting its feasibility. By a web platform, uh, we sent more than 1,600 uh, uh, invitations. And we got uh, um, the reply from uh, only 43 companies that represent a participation rate of 2.4%, which is not uh, surprising because it is compared with other studies. The majority of manager and all worker responded positively to participate in biomonitoring study. The main reasons for refusing participation include the concerns about data confidentiality and sufficient knowledge about nanomaterial health and safety. Acquisitions of individual study results, improvement of worker safety, and led to the development of nanomaterial specific health and safety practice were among the most valuable reasons for positively considering the participation. All workers indicated feeling comfortable with biomonitoring procedures of exam air and many other with urine and book assessment. So setting up the protocol, such a harmonized protocol should fulfill many prerequisites, create a characterized registry of eligible participants for prospective epidemiological studies, standardize all the processes, including population characterization, exposure assessment, biological sampling, validate a panel of biomarkers, and assess the relationship between exposure and health effects, and assess the association between airborne particle exposure 
and such biomarkers in terms of causal inference, especially after reducing, whenever possible, the extent of exposure. The study design is uh, an international multicenter prospective cohort with the first follow up end point at six, uh, nine months after the recruitment. In both the recruitment, they follow up field campaigns, biological matrix sampling, or biomarkers analysis is conducted twice before and after four day monitoring of external exposure. The initial campaign allows to set up the court as well as to provide a baseline evaluation of relationship between external exposure and biological parameters. The follow-up campaign will reassess exposure biomarker association after exposure control being implemented by companies upon the findings gathered for the first phase. One of the first priority of conducting human field studies is identifying and characterize the study population as to build consistent exposure registries, which require standardized coding for title, activities, processes, but also state of the art and harmonized method for quantification exposure. Recruitment has been uh, conducted in parallel by a member of the non-explore consorts. Recruitment strategies rely on a two-step procedure. First, member of the non-explore consortium, uh, we recruit eligible companies in their respective countries to get a representative sample of company. Consortium member will make use of professional contact with companies established during the regular activity or with occupational physician or during the non-explore and previously conducted surveys and an announcement it posted on the non-explore website. During the recruitment priority will be given to the companies with confirmed nanomaterial exposure and with at least five exposed workers. In a second step, a site information visit will be organized and has been organized actually to the companies that gave their agreement to participate in the study. Before or during the visit, a company questionnaire will be administered to manager or health and safety specialists in order to collect standardized information on company activities, processes, at risk or perceived risk for nanomaterial exposure, equipment and infrastructure already available for protection of their employees. Next, only the eligible workers will be required recruiting. A member of the non explore consortium will explain study objectives, procedures, and potential risk and benefit related to the study participant. Workers willing to participate will then provide it with detailed information about data collection and a written informed consent will be obtained for each participant before or his inclusion. A recruitment database will uh, then be created and progressively fitted and filled in upstream from and during the war recruitment campaign. It is noteworthy that in many companies, the so-called non-exposed workers may be non-intentionally exposed to because uh, the lack of effect, effective confinement between production and administration area. To the purpose, we suggest to split the non-exposed groups in two subgroups, a groups with negligible or low nanomaterial exposure, so-called internal control group, consisting of administrative office workers from the same company where the workers for the exposed group are recruited, and a true non-exposed group, universal control group, consisting of workers with confirmed absence of exposure to nanomaterials in their occupational setting. This uh, pre-location has only the purpose of facilitating participation recruiting, but the final classification of participants will respect nanomaterial exposure is based, and it will be based on individual exposure monitoring. Just a very important uh, topic is uh, 
the uh, sample size calculation. Sample size should comply with the main study objective to assess the association between variation in external exposure patterns and markers of effect is to validate a panel of biomarkers for human biomonitoring studies. To this purpose, we aim to determine the total sample size required to identify differences in biomarker level between exposed workers, the so-called exposed groups, and non-exposed workers. The procedure is not easy, but uh, just to go to the conclusion of uh, our calculations, according to our calculations, Taking into account a loss to follow up ratio of 20% due, due to the constraints related to biological sampling and employee turnover, a total of 80 exposed workers and 80 non exposed workers are needed. The consortium assigned a great attention to the confidentiality and data protection issues. A uh, written informed consent from volunteers prior to enrollment in the study was gathered. The consent form will be scanned and, and be scanned and sent to Unisante Unify Care, a secure platform developed by the SHUV. And so there are only the dematerialization of data. But uh, upon enrollment, workers will be assigned a code number in a way that does not disclose his or her identity, while still permitting the ability to identify the person for notification purposes, for instance, for uh, some changes or abnormal results. The key assigning workers' identity and contact detail to personal code will be recorded and stored on a secure server. This registry will enable court set, set up and follow up. Only people with a justified need to know will have access to these key documents. All, all other participant mentions, uh, whether on a paper document in a numeric file, in the electronic case report form or in a biological sample pertaining to any phase of the pilot will be code labeled. Participating company and workers will be characterized using questionnaire. An epidemiological questionnaire is uh, already being administered using the REDCAP software installed on tablets. The links between uh, uh, the links will be sent, have been sent to participants by the partner institutions. The use of electronic questionnaire and case reports was preferred as this prevent data collection from human errors related to entering data of the paper questionnaire to the red card. Data consists of three files, paper files, company questionnaire, for instance, samples, uh, from different biological matrices, ABC, urine, exposure filters for environmental uh, monitoring, and numeric file. All these have been stored on the uh, specific platform at Unisante. But this is a, a very complex interplay among uh, information that we are uh, managing. Uh, some confounding variables have also been considered mainly in the questionnaire on individual risk factors and possible co-exposure, potentially affected the meaning of the biomarkers, like the pulmonary function testing, uh, which have been performed according to the uh, recommendation of the Scientific Society of Pulmonology. By the epidemiological questionnaires, we uh, have been addressed occupational, environmental, and domestic exposure determinants. In epidemiological terms, exposure should be considered as a predictor variable. To date, only the US NIOSH study on carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofiber have carried out a personal exposure.
whereas some other study like Pinano French court, exposure was assessed only qualitatively. The assessment of airborne exposure to nanomaterials based on aerosol sampling analysis should be considered as the minimal requirement pondering between the study visibility in different occupational settings and the scientific value of its result. Whenever possible, it should be completed with a more thorough individual exposure assessment. NanoExplorer set up an innovative toolkit of devices, including three modules, the optical particle counter module, the nanoparticle sensor or part vector, and the transmission electron microscopy particle samplers. With the optical OPC module, it is possible to measure mass concentration of particulate, particulate matter with a size lower than 1, 2.5, and 10 microns. With a nonparticle sensor, it is possible to measure the electrical diffusion charge at the edge or uh, of airborne particles and to calculate the line deposited surface area parameter in real time, and the transmission electron is uh, uh, allowed to um, the particle and uh, nano objects image. For the pilot phase of the Nano Explorer project, we have assessed a broad panel of biomarkers reflecting different biological endpoints, oxidative and nitrosative stress, inflammation, dysregulation of immune system, of the defense and impairment and activation on the profibrotic cascade as to evaluate their performance, applicability, and relevance in field studies. This slide describes these biomarkers and their biological meaning, but the protocol also includes a thorough description of analytical methods. Just uh, very quickly, uh, the biomarkers measure uh, about the, the matrices selected. The first uh, four biomarkers um, will be, have been and will be measured in, uh, in urine, but also the first three also in uh, exhaled breath condensate as biomarkers of effect. The, uh, there is a, a huge battery of uh, cytokines and uh, inflammogenic biomarkers that uh, should be analyzed different pathways uh, of exposure uh, uh, and disease as effect biomarkers. Um, there are also some new biomarkers that for the first time we applied to the uh, cohort under study and also that can reveal not only, uh, not only acute effect, but especially have to a predictive meaning so they can uh, suggest possible impairment uh, over that functional uh, changes. And uh, another original biomarkers is the oxidant potential of exhaled air, uh, which is uh, the oxidative stress reflecting the redox balance of the airways. As a biomarkers of exposure, we suggest to use uh, the metal content in urine and in ABC, and to measure the concentration and the size of particles uh, by the nanoparticle tracking analysis in biological matrices, just to have an idea of the body burden or the deposited dose at the respiratory level. Uh, this, uh, this slide uh, summarizes uh, the timeline for a four day field campaign. The biological sampling in blue and the spirometer assessment in green will take place uh, twice in pre and post shift. Exposure monitoring in orange or pink, I don't know, will be conducting over a four day, eight hour worksheet. The overall coordination will be done with workers' individual electronic case report. Form and the numbers you uh, that are reported in the picture uh, relate to the specific procedures, studies adapted for the section of the protocol. The protocol obviously 
has been submitted to the bioethics committees of uh, at least three countries, but it will be submitted to other countries. And uh, as far as we know, this is the first harmonized protocol for an international multicenter for effective court studies of nanomaterial work in the world. It enables to fulfill reproducibility, comparability, and precision of data collected during the field campaign or across different research teams, companies, and countries. The prospective design of this court with regular follow-ups campaigns also enables nesting intervention studies focused on exposure control in companies with high nanomaterial exposure and monitoring health effects at medium and long terms. These features are paramount when assessing the causality, particularly when the expected diseases are chronic non-communicable diseases with a long latency times before the clinical manifestation, for instance, as such as COPD. The originality and strength of this protocol consists of its standardized to adaptive nature with electronic multilingual procedures. These procedures and tools for the implementation have been developed based on the previous exploratory studies conducted by the Nanoexplore Consortium members in a highly interdisciplinary framework. To date, preliminary investigation carried out in two outstanding companies have been implemented in a three country studies and have involved 140 workers. The first result of such pilot studies not presented here, sorry, confirmed that the importance of a harmonized protocol and standardized procedures, allowing an effective management of geographical and cultural differences in participating countries and companies. A good level of integration of local study coordinators within the Nanoexplorer Consortium also appeared paramount for organizational and logistical reasons, especially pertaining to biological samples, collection, storage, and transportation. The proposed procedures are easily accepted and their use is positively associated with participation rates. Moreover, this protocol meets all the requirements of a hypothesis driving a longitudinal study, which will assess and reassess effect on nanomaterial exposure on work itself by updating the follow-up in the court. This protocol especially enables the launching of an international court of nanotechnology workers. As an open court, it could grow by including additional workers from new nanotechnology companies from various countries, which could join the Nanoexplore Consortium and apply this harmonized protocol. Finally, the main, uh, uh, the main uh, uh, advantage of a HEVA collaborative multicenter project is that many expertise have been uh, participated in these studies. And so I have to thank all people that contributed uh, uh, in uh, uh, not only in the protocol, but also in the field study realization. Uh, so thank you for your attention. And uh, if you want to make some question, I am available. Yeah, thank you. This is the question from Anita Tevados. And uh, she asks whether Regarding the OPI essay, how many specific this is uh, towards uh, peroxides, hydrogen, and if we've noticed some inferences from other chemical substances in exalt breath. Thank you for this question. It's a difficult question because I'm most on the medical side of the project and uh, epidemiology and not uh, in uh, chemistry. As I said, it was mostly the Guillaume Suarez group's uh, work. Uh, 
but I will try to answer. So for us, the OPR is mostly the effect biomarker rather than exposure biomarker. Because uh, in our previous uh, clinical study, we measured the OPR in people who have confirmed COPD diagnosis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is highly associated with smoking, but also with exposure to dust particles. And we observed that these biomarkers was very well predicting those who have the COPD compared with those who do not, and especially in people who are not smokers, which was very, very interesting because it means that it could distinguish between occupationally related COPD and, and the, the absence of this health condition. And uh, within uh, OPIH studies that I presented for the reference interval calculation, we also conducted additional clinical validation, let's say, and we observed that, uh, that OPR in a more larger, in a larger sample from OPR, she's a study, Swiss Health study, was associated with worsening of spirometry parameters. Spirometry is a functional lung testing, or pulmonary testing, so it was uh, predicting the values which are less than the normal values for some of them. And it was also associated with the immunity against the COVID and SARS infection, either through infection or through vaccination. So we had these two additional hints that OPI is the effect biomarker. And in another project, which is called Robocop, which is conducted to measure the effect of particles, uh, large, fine, and ultra-fine particles in uh, the subway environment like Parisian Metro. So it's a big study conducted in Parisian Metro. We looked at the associations between different sort of particles, their metal components and oxidative potential, and we found no association at all. The only one which was suggested, but uh, with a very limited statistical significance was the link between ultrafine particles and OPA. But when we modeled it with uh, uh, accounting for confounders, it disappeared completely. So no association with exposure, but rather the association with health conditions. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Uh, I see, I see a, a question by Araceli. Uh, nice to see you, Araceli. Uh, so can you tell us something on the association of ambient nanomaterials concentrations and the biomarkers level? <laughs> Is the pivotal questions of, uh, of our project. So we, are, uh, we have... Uh, finished the, uh, the field campaigns and we are uh, analyze all samples and we are just making a preliminary uh, assessment, uh, statistical assessment. So it's, 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 it's a little bit premature, but anyway, no, anyway, we can disclose because it's not. Actually, uh, Considering the exposure parameters, uh, both in qualitative term, but refining exposure in, uh, uh, in uh, quantitative term, I mean, especially consider the um, number of particles uh, detected by the uh, non-explored devices and the further refined by um, this mini, hmm? we have uh, uh, we are able to distinguish differences for the most parameters investigated among the three groups, the, the three subgroups, with uh, with uh, high exposure, uh, the low exposure, and uh, non-exposed. Um, I think that uh, almost all parameters uh, gave uh, very good estimates, estimated, estimates, sorry, 
Uh, also consider that there is a huge variability both in biomarkers and also in, uh, in uh, exposure parameters. But anyway, also thanks to the very uh, careful interaction, a very, very, uh, very good, very important interaction with the uh, health and safety manager of the two companies, Caracol and ICN2 in Spain, we have the opportunity to well characterize uh, exposure and so to assign uh, not for all people a personal uh, a personal uh, exposure parameters, but for almost people uh, a good uh, uh, exposure characterization, and so to understand uh, that uh, there are some uh, exposure related trends in biomarker concentration. Uh, both uh, in positive and in negative sense, because uh, actually not all the biomarkers uh, um, have the tendency to increase. There are also some biomarkers with a tendency of decrease. Uh, and this can reflect uh, subtle changes, especially in the respiratory uh, health of people uh, which are exposed to a high level of particles in occupational setting. Uh, another question <laughs> for me, have you noticed that any correlation between the exposure routes and the concentration of biomarkers in biofluid? Uh, but uh, the, 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 the answer is, is quite uh, simple because uh, we, uh, in occupational settings, we um, investigate, especially if not only the, the respiratory pathways as exposure route, uh, probably different particles of different composition have that different biokinetics. And uh, also because the particle investigated have on one side uh, a huge uh, distribution, no, not very huge, but quite huge distribution uh, in sizes. So submicron particles and nanoparticles can have different biokinetic. Uh, we were surprised in uh, some occupational setting to find uh, uh, also when uh, uh, micron-sized particles are handled, also um, uh, important, relevant concentration of nanoparticles in uh, aerosols. And uh, I think that the, our biomarkers explore not only the respiratory uh, biology, but also the systemic effects. But uh, unfortunately, oh, by, we, we didn't uh, approach uh, the biomonitoring using, for instance, uh, blood uh, biomarkers because uh, it rely on uh, blood drawing. So we can lower the acceptance of the biomonitoring procedures. Correlation in statistical terms should be assessed, and uh, but the only pathways we examine actually is the respiratory, the inhalation route. Uh, may I add something, Enrico? Yes, of course. Well, um, we actually have a very extensive epidemiological questionnaire and uh, very often uh, the skin exposure could not be excluded. Therefore, and sometimes skin exposure or exposure from the resuspended uh, particulate matters and particles from the, those deposited or contaminating uh, 
closes or, or surfaces is also possible. That's why we have this internal non-exposed group. And uh, of course, it's difficult to dis disentangle them. But however, we have questionnaires asking whether participants use uh, the personal protective equipment and which type of personal protective equipment. And if in some of participants or in some subgroups, we will see uh, exposure levels higher than in other, we could look then if there is an association with a, a lesser use or less frequent use of some EPA, especially gloves or respiratory protection. Another uh, particularity in uh, our pilot investigation is that it was conducting during uh, COVID pandemic. And some uh, field campaigns were organized between two lockdowns. And uh, so we are quite sure that the respiratory protection was very well <laughs> respected. Now what's regarding skin protection and gloves uh, use, this, the, um, the analysis of our data will tell us more, but it's not yet available. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the questions. Thank you, Irina.